Have you ever thought about making your own podcast? Okay, so you have your script. You're ready to record. So now what? Anchor, a podcasting platform, can come to your rescue. I use it for my podcasts because of the ease of having Anchor distribute my episodes on other podcasting platforms, such as Spotify and Apple Podcast. It's a free platform with its own creation tools that make it easy for you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And the best part? You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Now that's a good deal. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Anchor.fm is everything you need to make a podcast. All in one place. And now, on with the show. Is every reaction a normal one if a psychologist says it is? How about the knowledge that you might have to live with this awful thing within you? You have lived a life accepting all of the rules, being a good role model and being nice. But it seems that might have never been enough. So do you break all the rules? Or do you try and find yourself at your lowest point? People are here to help, but it's your choice of what you do with it all. Adam is a healthy 20-something with a girlfriend and a great job in the radio industry. He has his parents and his best friend's support. His boss likes him, and he is financially secure. He doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink, and he doesn't drive. A likeable guy, as suddenly gets a tumour in his back. What do you do with that information? You have followed all of the right advice, the right rules, and gained an air of yourself in your own little world. And then, there is that moment, when the peace is ruined, creating a ripple effect of various disasters. You have a 50% chance at survival. So when the stakes are high on your life, do you go back to the way things were within yourself? We are two takes, and this is one shot. An analysis of the film 50-50. What Adam has developed in his spine is the cancerous tumour called Swanoma neurofibrosarcoma. Swanoma neurofibrosarcoma It's a bit of a mouthful. So for an easier understanding, let's look loosely at this tumour. It is known that swanomas are most often non-manigland tumours, meaning they are not cancerous. Neurofibrosarcomas are the cancerous ones. So why the confusing title? Let's dig deeper. Swanomas develop from swan cells, known for their roles in supporting nerve regeneration and development, conduction of nervous impulses and long axons, support of neurons in the peripheral nervous system and the nerve root. In general, the swan cells provide support by wrapping around the nerves and nerve roots, whilst also producing the fatty insulin called myelin that surrounds those nerves and helps their signals travel faster. Whilst on the subject, and for definition, I shall explain some more before we move on. Peripheral nervous system refers to the parts of the nervous system are outside of the central nervous system, those outside of the brain and the spinal cord. This system carries signals from the brain and the spinal cord, the central nervous system, to the muscles and tissues of the body. The inclusion of the nerve root in the swan cells' primary function is because the nerve root itself is the first part of the nerve leaving the spinal cord and then becomes a peripheral nerve, and so, in a small way, the functions run full circle throughout the body. Going back to the sonoba itself, when it grows large enough, it may begin compressing and putting a pressure on the nerve itself, whilst damaging the myelin in the facility of the nerve. Together, the compression and the myelin damage causes the symptoms of the sonoma, such as numbness, weakness, paralysis in the face, painless or painful growth or swelling of the face, hearing loss or ringing in the ears, and loss of coordination and balance. But Adam didn't get any of these symptoms. Well, not to our knowledge, so why is such a long name for his cancer? This leads us to the next part in explaining it. Neurofibrosarcomas and the swanomas, nerve sheathed tumours, meaning they involve the coating around nerve fibres that transmit messages to and from the brain and the spinal cord, the nervous system, and the rest of the body. The symptoms, though only one being usually linked to Adam's troubles at the beginning of the film, have more of an impact to this tumour. 
the swelling or a lump in the arms or legs, difficulty using arms, legs, hands or feet, and the primary one that is linked to Adam, pain or soreness. And so, the name of the tumour, swanoma, for where the tumour has hit the body, and neurofibrosarcoma, for the cancerous nerve seeds within the swan cell dysfunction. Such a small connection, I know, but a problem such as backache led to this tumour. Think about that for a moment. Anything can go wrong in the human body, and you wouldn't know about it until further down the line. The shock of this news to Adam brings forward a stream of emotions that are acted and reacted throughout the film until the very end. The initial reaction to a cancer diagnosis is often shock and, dis and disbelief, followed by distressed symptoms of anxiety, anger and depression. During the early period of acknowledging the diagnosis, they may experience other symptoms such as decreased interest in sexual activity, fatigue, difficulty concentrating and remembering or making decisions, insomnia or oversleeping, weight loss and appetite loss, and restlessness or irritability. These symptoms might seem unhealthy, but they are simply a normal part of the process of dealing with the diagnosis. We see straight after Adam's trip to the doctors that he goes online and researches his, his condition. For some patients, this research elevates anxiety, and understanding his conversation with his best friend Kyle, it helps someone, but maybe not Adam himself. What was interesting in Adam's decisions to tell those around him was the order he did it in. If we include the recommended supportive psychotherapy and interactive treatment that helps maintain, restore or improve self-esteem, ego functions and adaptive skills in many given dilemmas, that introduces us to Catherine, the young doctor in training, and if we also exclude his mother and father who make a late appearance in Adam's support system through Adam's choice, then we can see a theory emerging within Adam's decisions and overall character and through the characteristics of those closest to him. Although the first person he tells is his girlfriend Rachel, her function in the movie is to represent one reaction to the diagnosis, which is through panic, lack of understanding and an abandonment through selfish explanation of struggling with the news. Though re representing the extreme of a reaction, Nevertheless, she disqualifies in the theory. Therefore, let's start with Kyle, the second person Adam tells about his diagnosis. This is where the theory will begin, with a person that is constantly with Adam throughout. Kyle is Adam's best friend and from the onset, through dry humour and honesty, immediately asks his, his odds of survival. Though a strange question, Adam answers 50-50, which makes Kyle relax and remarks that if Adam was a bet, he would be the best odds. An uplifting thought through the chaos, and I might add, the only person who reacts in a glass half full vibe. Kyle can be seen as Adam's id, as an external presentation of a primitive and instinct led part of the mind that contains sexual and aggressive drives. This part of the mind is the unconscious and impulsive part of the psyche that responds immediately and directly to basic urges, needs and desires. The id's responds through the pleasure principle, which is that every idea and wishful impulse must be satisfied immediately regardless of the consequences. The id engages in primary process thinking, which is primitive, illogical, irrational and fantasy orientated, making its objectives selfish and wishful in nature. Sounds like Kyle, right? Carl is impulsive, disregarding any importance to small things around him, such as getting to work on time, constantly getting coffee somewhere else when there is a perfectly functioning coffee machine in the office, and taking long, loud phone calls that, that should be quick. He talks to Adam about having sex, and how Adam should be getting it constantly, disregarding the troubles that Rachel has had for the past month, and this is only presented in the first 10 minutes of his character. He is on Adam's side. There is no doubt about it, knowing fully that he is constantly trying to tell Adam that he deserves many things and finding apparent and quick solutions to long-term problems such as hitting on women in every chance he can. Even dedicating a workplace party of sorts for Adam and trying to sound caring. When on the date with the bookstore clerk, reacts to the artwork almost convincingly with enthusiasm. However, 
His true colours instantly spark back on when Rachel is seen kissing another man. Without thought, he swears and, and snaps a picture to show Adam. His reactions are not thought through, and even in the scene of Adam's and Rachel's breakup, he is there enacting it, mediating it almost, and like a subconscious voice in the back of the mind, says insults to Rachel until she is forced to leave. What is interesting is the fact that in other films that include breakups, it takes a lot longer for the character that has the information to ruin a relationship to come forth. This is why Kyle, though going by impulse, has done the right thing for his friend, even if it is for the unfortunate selfish reason of having a wingman. An example being getting two women to come clubbing with them. And even though Adam says he is tired, Kyle demands that he plays his part, saying that the conclusion will indeed be sex in about knife five minutes' time. Adam compromises after seeing the woman's unimpressed expressions by saying he has weed at his house. He does score warn all the women, but the point is, is that Adam, being the ego, and I shall go in more depth later, is weak in relation to the headstrong id, Kyle. The best the ego can do is hang on, pointing the id in the right direction and claim some credit at the end of the night. Adam then invites his mother and father over for dinner, breaking the news to them in the first moments before eating. Adam's uneasiness is trying to find an allergy to try and ease the horribleness of the situation. However, with Rachel's prompt, he simply says he has cancer. His mum asks for how long, with Adam answering that the doctor's visit happened a couple of days ago. His mother's reaction, finding it unbelievable that her only son chose not to tell about this distressing news for a couple of days, finds her going through many emotions in a very quick succession. From anger of not being told, to panic where she states that she's going to move in, to saddening hopefulness to try and make it better by going and doing something utterly hopeless, such as making Adam herbal tea that is known for cutting down cancer by 15%. Adam's father does not say a word looking around awkwardly and attempting to eat his pizza. It can be seen that Adam's dad's Alzheimer's is presented in the movie as another metaphor for the hopelessness of something out of control, of the person experiencing something medical. Adam's dad cannot help his condition, and neither can Adam with his. And now, on to Catherine, the doctor in training. Her quirky and uncertain treatment methods, as well as the unethical attachment to her third patient, will not be discussed as I can imagine it's been talked about on various other podcasts. What I wish to concentrate on is her mannerisms. Catherine, in many shapes and forms, is Adam's superego. The superego's function is to persuade the ego to turn to moralistic goals rather than simply realistic ones and to perhaps strive for perfection. The superego consists of two systems, the conscience and the ideal self. The conscience can punish the ego through causing feelings of guilt, the act of making emotion come into play. And the ideal self is the imaginary picture of how one ought to be, representing career aspirations, how to treat other people, and how to behave as a member of society. Catherine is constantly reminding and making Adam question his reactions to those around him, especially in the scene about how he complains about his annoying mother, when really she's just simply worrying and trying to reach out to her unresponsive son a moral thought pattern by making Adam see outside of himself. On the first meeting of Catherine and Adam, Catherine is trying to act professional, not getting the bad jokes and attempting to control the situation by explaining Adam's symptoms back to himself was trying to be sympathetic. In another scene, the lines of who is helping who when Catherine gives Adam a ride home indicate Catherine's uncomfortableness when the small talk becomes personal, emphasising the superego system of conscious taking over by changing the subject or stopping it in its tracks, making Adam feel guilty by, for trying to emphasise with a psychologist about relationships. We can see Adam as a good person, and Catherine is too, however her stumbling block is a drive of trying to be too many things at once, a person in her own right, a psychologist, a student, a friend to others. It can become difficult. Her goals, in which she explains in her first meeting, is that she's a psychologist in training, as Adam is at a training hospital, already explains to the audience about her drive for career aspirations. And later on in the movie, it is indicated again on how much she works, which is a lot, placing the idea of the ideal self to be quite important through these aspirations, as well as Catherine's slip-ups that she always addresses, attempting to steer the conversation into a more moral ground. 
This leads us to Adam, the personification of the ego. The ego is there to essentially mediate between the unrealistic id and the external real world, hence Adam's relationship with Carl, with Adam's good intentions always making sure Carl is okay. Ideally, the ego works by reason, operating according to the reality principle, the principle of working out realistic ways of satisfying the id's demands, often compromising or postponing satisfaction to avoid negative consequences. The example again, being when Adam compromised by asking the two women to come to his apartment, thus satisfying Carl's desire for sex, whilst enabling Adam's need for sleep to come closer to coming true. The ego considers social realities and norms, etiquette and rules in deciding how to behave. Like the id, the ego does seek pleasure and avoids pain. But unlike the id, the ego is concerned with devising a realistic strategy. There is no concept of right or wrong. Something is good simply if it achieves an end of satisfying without causing harm to itself or the id. Therefore, there is no thought of the consequences if it doesn't harm anyone. One example could be Adam's conversation with Catherine on the phone the night before his surgery. His barriers of retaining all of his frustrations and anger had amounted to calling someone who was essentially not trying to use him. He calls Catherine, and because of the hint of a connection and throwing caution to the wind, essentially tells a psychologist that she would be a good girlfriend, whereas Catherine, being the superego, does not hint anything and simply says girlfriends are nice. Still a safe conversation, and no one got hurt. The first time Catherine and Carl meet each other is in the waiting room as strangers, the id finding the superego to perhaps be uptight and to not give away any information about Adam, with the superego finding it surprising how the id chooses to defend his actions related to Adam, perhaps thinking that the superego might judge the id. The second time is when Catherine comes over with pizza right at the end of the movie. The indication of this interaction is how Carl has taken care of Adam for so long that Catherine take, makes a joke about it on the same level, breaking the ice and essentially showing the id that she also has Adam's interests at heart. It is an interesting and rather whole theory, however, finding these people having more characteristics in one category than the other, Adam being more like the ego, and so on, marks how these characters intertwine. The more they interact with each other, the more the barriers come down, and thus, consequences are not thought through. Things are said that might have been left unsaid, and so forth. The id, the ego, and the superego is within all of us, and presenting characters that represent each one to then collide with each other, their developments rubbing each other, to then form an interesting mix of a mess, makes them more human than ever before. This aspects of the film mingles a traumatic and very specific event that essentially explodes these series into light, bringing forth the more natural response of how each characteristic of a person, the id, the ego, and superego are always going to be together, and perhaps having this film as an example of this theory is to what happens in real life, whether it be between friends, lovers, or families. Personalities always form, and they always change, especially when trauma and chaos come into the mix, and how one establishes these reactions and behavioural patterns can really define who you're going to be at the end of this journey, much like Adam and the people around him. If you enjoyed what was said, please follow me on Anchor and Spotify. Be kept in the loop for new episodes by following my Instagram. And if you have any questions, email me at twotakespodcast1 at gmail.com. And as always, thanks for listening.